Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Now, we're coming up to the anniversary of coronavirus. I know it started earlier, but like the first lockdowns, and I've managed to avoid talking about it before, hoping it would go away. It hasn't. So now I have to sing about it. So I've got a few guests coming up about this. Um, the first is an anti-lockdown epidemiologist from Harvard Medical School who co-authored the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, it's a controversial paper signed by many leading epi- epidemiologists, but criticized by, by many other leading epidemiologists. Uh, he, the author calls for the protection of the vulnerable rather than nationwide lockdowns. Let's speak with Martin Kulthorn. I just first want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me and um, I just wanted to start with it on a personal aspect how has this been for you since you since you came out to the public with this this great Barrington declaration and really put your neck on the line here how have things been for you personally uh, busy but that's a good thing I think mm. so uh, uh, I appreciate all the interest and all the support that we received for the great Barrington declaration um, and also, uh, we have a very good team effort with the other two uh, authors of the declaration. So, uh, but it's been sort of uh, strange to get uh, some of these attacks, uh, personal attacks. Mm-hmm. When it comes from random people on Twitter, I don't really care about it. But it's surprising when it comes from uh, academics or journalists. So, yes, I mean, with my other guests, I tell my friends who I'm interviewing, and they don't really care what questions I ask. You know, they don't, I, I, but I feel under pressure now because this, this is an issue that's affecting everyone. So I can only imagine what it must be like for you coming out into the public eye. Yeah, and I'm just a simple scientist, so I never expected or uh, wanted to be uh, sort of in the media. That's not my sort of personality. But sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Mm. Because you are... You're not just anybody. You are Harvard University medical s- specialist in epidemiology. This is your area. So it's not just my opinion or anyone's. Yeah, so I have been working for a couple of decades on infectious disease outbreaks, um, on how to detect them and how to monitor them. So like the population aspects of uh, uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, and as such, when... Uh, when the media says that there is scientific consensus for something and uh, I don't agree with that, but I'm one of the, the scientists who works very much in this field, then I think it's the responsibility to speak up and I don't think I have a choice actually. Well, the, before you came out, there was really no debate. There was, the media was wall to wall. When I was with my parents watching the BBC coverage, it was all about how the lockdown is, is should be enforced and how we do, people were who were not doing it, locking down hard enough, everybody was jumping on them. Yeah, correct. And I tried to make my voice heard back in March, April, but I wasn't able to publish anything in the United States. I, I failed utterly. I was able to publish in my native Sweden in the, daily, uh, the major daily newspapers there, but in the US, no. And... Uh, what we say in the Great Barrington Declaration is nothing novel or or new. It's something that the three of us has been saying for, for a long time, as well as many others. So what what was different, I think, with the Great Barrington Declaration is that there were three of us, so it's harder to just be three people than one. We all uh, work at uh, respectable universities. Oxford, uh, that's Stanford, it hard. Harvard. Yeah, and that's make it harder to, uh, to dismiss. And we also all having worked with infectious disease epidemiology. So they can't dismiss us for not being in the field. So uh, so that's how we succeeded. It was it made it impossible for for the media to uh, to ignore us anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was a huge success. Instead, some of the media showed a great interest, but there were other parts of the media who sort of started to come up with very strange uh, um, arguments and smears and, and so on that's truly really unrelated to public health so that was kind of strange but uh, maybe that's how media works nowadays i don't know 
Well, the, I, I was a Guardian reader when I lived in England. It's a very respected <laughs> newspaper. And I, I went the, when I searched f for you, the f first page that comes up on Google is uh, you were criticized because the headline was that you went on a podcast where there were Holocaust deniers previously as guests or something like that, which is just crazy reason to yeah i don't uh, I don't, i'm not in the cap i'm just a simple scientist so i'm not in the capacity to check those things uh, i haven't checked what guests you have had on your show before well uh, so and i'm sure so you're a good person who <laughs> haven't so but, far uh, no I mean, holocaust designers no <laughs> so good uh, but that's sort of impossible for me to do do all that checking it's um, incredible i mean from a respected newspaper like that it's just and then they, they also criticize also, they, they said that people, you, you put the open, the declaration open for people to sign if anyone else wants to sign it. And then they said, oh, well, people were signing it, Mickey Mouse and things like that. And which is just Yeah, I think Johnny Bananas was kind of a funny name who signed it. And uh, somebody put in Neil Ferguson, who obviously didn't sign it, but uh, I think there were three signatures of him. But it's very strange, actually, because there was one journalist who was bragging on Twitter that she was adding fake signatures to the declaration which we removed uh, after a few days. But then there were other journalists. So one journalist is, is bragging about adding fake signature, and then other journalists are complaining that they have fake signatures on, uh, on the declaration. So to me, I don't understand the media and journalism, but to me, that seems very, very absurd and strange Yeah, uh, to opt for journalists to operate in such a manner. I know it's crazy. You, you really don't understand the media until you're the target of it, do you? Until you, until it's focused on you. Yeah, and actually, there's a difference I, because I have not just been in the U.S. or, or media, but uh, I have been on the media around the world, uh, uh, Latin America, India, Africa, uh, and so on. And uh, I have to say that in the U.S. media and the U.K. media they either tend to be very friendly and they already agree or they are quite hostile mm. and they sort of try to chip you up with sort of very strange questions. Um, in other countries, I have not received so much of that, but there's very, very good journalists. They ask very hard questions, but there's good, hard epidemiological and public health questions. And I think that's what they should do. And that's what I want because uh, the public has, has good questions. So the journalists have to ask those. Uh, but I haven't experienced sort of this uh, uh, ridiculous uh, smears and uh, uh, bringing up uh, Johnny Bananas and those kinds of nonsense <laughs> from, uh, uh, from journalists outside of the UK and the US. Mm, mm. So that's sort of an interesting personal anecdote uh, in terms of the media in the UK, US media versus other countries. Yes, yeah, because you are Swedish and you've moved to America, so you have a really a broad understanding of the way things work. Yeah, and actually in Sweden, there's been a much more very, uh, open discussion about the pros and cons of different uh, COVID strategies, hmm. which I think is good. And uh, there are people who who think differently from what I do, who has been uh, and who disagree with the Swedish uh, strategy, who has been very vocal about it and been publishing in the major newspapers. And I have responded to some of those in the newspapers, so I don't think, uh, agree with them, but I think it's very good that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Is they're actually doing a service to the country because it is good that uh, concerns about whatever strategy you have, that those are voiced so that people can list, uh, read them and listen to them and then sort of try to understand different uh, perspectives. So I think even though I, I disagree with, with them, uh, I am very glad that they wrote what they wrote. Hmm. I think they're doing a service to, uh, to both the science and the, and, the, and the country. Yes, I think it's great because I also, I was listening to some of the interviews you shared on Twitter and there's, there was one of the co-signers, Jay, uh, Jay Bhattacharya, was discussing with another epidemiologist about about the... Because there's this Jon Snow memorandum that these... Yes, yeah. These other epidemiologists who are more in favor of lockdown and they were debating. Um, yes, so I think that was a very good uh, debate uh, between Dr. Bhattacharya and uh, Mark Lipsitch. Hmm. Uh, who is uh, a well-established infectious disease technologist. So I, I encourage people to listen to that. It was uh, organized by uh, by the Journal of the American Medical Association. Mm. 
Uh, and if you search for Bharacharya, Lipsitch, or Jama, some combination there, you will find it. And I highly recommend that uh, because those uh, scientific discourse is very important. Mm. Uh, it's important uh, in order to maintain trust uh, and confidence in uh, science and public health and the scientific community, which I think have taken a big hit this year. Yeah, I think so. I mean, with with economics, for example, economists, economists, you expect them to have different views and they're always arguing between them. But with something as important as this, we, we you, you need to know. I mean, before I heard about the Great Barrington Declaration, I really didn't know. I just accepted what what I'd heard. You know, I didn't have the really have the authority to to say, well, is, you know, is the lockdown really good or bad? You know, I didn't want to I didn't have the knowledge. So it's really good that you have come out with this and and there were actually in that debate there were lots of they were both in agreement that schools should be reopened and that the greater harm was to to children and young people yeah so that's actually one very positive aspect of uh, the discussions and also the great parental declaration that uh, there is an increasing Fewer and fewer people are arguing for schools being closed. I don't think there are many scientists to argue for it anymore. There are still some politicians who are clinging to their closed schools. But uh, uh, in that debate, both uh, Baracharya, Dr. Baracharya and uh, Mark Lipsic agreed that schools should be open. And I think that's very positive. Mm. Um, there's no public health reason to keep them closed. There never was. And it's enormous damage to children, not just education, but their physical health and their mental health and their social development. And in Sweden, which kept schools open all through the height of the pandemic in the spring, uh, it was open for ages 1 to 15 and 1.8 billion children. And there, were absolute, there was exactly zero death of COVID-19 during this time among these children. And teachers were at no higher risk than the average of other professions. So... There's absolutely no reason to keep schools closed, uh, no matter what is the level of transmission. And I think uh, the Great Barrington Declaration, as well as uh, many others who have been fighting for opening schools, uh, I think there's a sort of a change in that. So that's good. There's still many schools that are closed in the United States, which is very tragic, but uh, I think that's changing. Was that known from the very beginning, or is COVID, was there the possibility that COVID was different to all the other viruses? It was known from the beginning that uh, uh, already in March it was known that uh, children had uh, much less risk. So what happens with COVID-19 is that um, anybody can get infected. So children can get infected, young adults can get infected, and they do get infected. But the risk for mortality is uh, there's more than a thousandfold difference in the risk of mortality among the oldest and the youngest. So for old people... COVID-19 is more severe, more dangerous than the annual influenza. Mm. But for children, it's the opposite. Uh, COVID-19 is less dangerous than the annual influenza. Mm. So there's an enormous difference in risk there. And we knew that in March. So um, Sweden did the right decision not to close the schools uh, and did it on very solid scientific uh, grounds. And... Uh, uh, were the people well, okay uh, with that? Was they w did did the people? Yeah, the people in Sweden was in, was very much in favor of that, and I think this children in Sweden were lucky because they have been able to live normal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, in the schools, they uh, if they if the kids were sick, they were told to stay home, and if they were sick in school, they were sent home. Uh, so that was uh, so that was sort of a countermeasure, and. Uh, uh, they did extra cleanings and those things in the schools, but uh, there were no masks, uh, no social distancing, so they can just play like normal kids. And uh, there were no testing. Mm. There's no need to test children. Uh, if they are sick, let them stay home, whatever, whether it's COVID-19 or not. And if they're not sick, if then let them go to school. Mm. So we're up to 19 then with COVID. Can you give us a bit of a backstory? Have, these other, have there been other serious COVIDs? Well, there are four other COVID uh, viruses that are endemic that are causing the common cold. And I expect that this coronavirus will also uh, uh, end up like that. We will never eradicate it. It will be endemic. And uh, most people will get it as a child 
where it's uh, where they will be asymptomatic, asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic, uh, just like a regular cold, and uh, then there will be immunity in the population. So uh, we don't know exactly if there will be a lifelong immunity or not, but uh, even if there's not lifelong immunity, if you've already been exposed once, you will typically have a less serious uh, disease again. And we don't really know these are the four coronaviruses. We don't really know if uh, uh, what happened when they arrived. Uh, there's one theory, I don't know if it's true or not, but that the Russian flu in the 1890s was actually due to not a flu, but to a coronavirus. But uh, we don't really know that, but that, that might have been. In, and that was, of course, a very serious pandemic mm. that we had then. And Spanish flu, was that also? Spanish flu was the influenza. Okay. okay. So that was not coronavirus, yeah. So, so there have been many. These are regular things. Though. This is this is why you have a job. No, this is why you are employed is to prepare us for these things. Yeah. So we have infectious diseases. That's a natural part of history. We've had it for for as long as we have recorded history. And uh, there are different types of infectious diseases. So we, I mean. Now and then we'll have a pandemic. There are going to be more pandemics. Mm. We don't know what the next virus will be, but there will certainly be another pandemic. And uh, But then, of course, the other infectious diseases, there are foodborne diseases, uh, waterborne diseases, there are uh, vector-borne diseases like animals, like malaria, for example, uh, or West Nile virus. And, uh, and then there are sexual transmitted infectious diseases. So uh, uh, infectious diseases is something that we have learned to live with. Yes. Uh, and uh, mostly successfully throughout the ages. And so suddenly this year, somehow it changed and suddenly we're going to do everything very differently than we've done before. So this lockdown is like a huge experiment and I think a huge fail failure. Uh, uh, it goes against all the pandemic preparedness plans that have been worked out before before this year. They were just thrown out the window. Could you tell? Could you tell us a bit about those? What what is what is standard procedure when it, when this happens? What should we norm, what we normally do? So uh, what those are are very similar to the focus protection that we outlined in the Great Barrington Declaration. Is that you? They don't they don't mention lockdowns. They mention you have to protect the or the the high risk people. Now we don't necessarily we don't know advanced who are going to be the high risk for a new uh, virus. Is it? Is it could it be children or could it be young people sometimes? Or? Yeah, so for example, the flu of 1918, uh, a lot of young people died. Really? So that was very, very uh, severe for young people, uh, while older people were not as affected. Uh, when I first heard that there was this outbreak in Wuhan in China, um, I quickly realized that this was going to be a worldwide pandemic because of the nature of it. Uh, that it was spreading so fast and that it was going to be impossible to contain. Um, and then I was worried for about 10 minutes because I'm a father, I have three kids. So as every parent, my, I, 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 that's my major concern is to the safety of my children. And I looked at the numbers and I could see that this is something that affects older people is, is very severely, but not children are not at risk here. Okay. Uh, so for 10 minutes, I was worried. And after that, I said, okay, fine. My children are fine. Not, nothing is going to happen to them. Okay. Uh, my oldest is 18. And I'm much more worried about him driving the car than I'm um, getting him getting uh, COVID-19. <laughs> so. Okay. So quite quickly, you, you, you look. Who is the who is a vulnerable? And you can tell that quite quickly, no? Yeah. So even we didn't know exactly what the infection fatality rate was overall, but we could see the relative risk for... for uh, for it. And we saw that uh, in Wuhan, there were a lot of old people who were hospitalized and died, but uh, uh, almost no children. And we know that in infectious disease like this, people will get exposed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that the children were not exposed, because obviously, if the grandparent had it or the parent sure, had sure. it, they would also get it. So to, to think that children in Wuhan had not been exposed to it, was obviously not true. Obviously, they were exposed to it, but then there were very few deaths and hospitalizations. So that means that there was something in their immune system that they were able to fight it off. Okay. And uh, we still don't know exactly what that process is, but we know that it's there and that there are 
uh, they, 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 they are, their immune system is taking, able to take care of this. So what are the other aspects of protocol that was that is drawn up by different governments? So the, the major aspects of Greg Bryanton declarations is, this is so it's twofold. One is we need to do a much better job than we're doing to protect older people. Um, and uh, those who are at highest risk are the nursing home residents. Okay. Uh, because not only are they old, they're also frail. So we do need to do frequent testing of staff. Uh, visitor, it's important that they get visitors because you can't lock them in and isolate them, uh, the residents. It's very important for their other aspects of other health that they can have visitors from friends and family. But uh, we have to test those visitors. And if you're visiting your your aunt or, or, or whatever, your, your grandfather uh, in the nursing home, uh, you should be tested. And if you're positive, then wait uh, three or four weeks. Mm. And maybe your cousin can visit instead or something like that. Also, there has to be less uh, rotation of staff rotation. That was uh, in, in nursing homes so that each residence are exposed to as few people as possible. Also, smaller nursing homes are better than larger nursing homes. And if, if one resident becomes sick, you have to remove them out so that they don't infect others. Uh, and of course, you also have to have basic hygiene, the washing hands and all those things. Uh, so the, we could do a lot more protecting nursing home residents mm -hmm. than we are doing. And I don't understand why we are not. Because um, those people are not in circulation anyway. So a lockdown, they're not affected by a lockdown. Uh, pardon? They're not. Those people are not in circulation, so they they live under permanent lockdown but anyway. Uh, yeah, so they live in a sort of a protected environment that's easy to protect them actually, mm -hmm. uh, as long as we do this uh, testing of nurse uh, of staff and visitors. Uh, another example is all people who live at home. They uh, uh, they should ha get help with grocery shopping. I see old people in the in the supermarket, and I don't think they should be there. Mm. Um, now it's important for them to be able to see friends and family and they should be out exercising, walking or, or bicycling or whatever uh, outdoors. Uh, and uh, if they see friends and relatives, they should preferably do it outdoors. But if that's not possible, they should also have uh, access to testing so that if they have a visitor, the visitor can test uh, be tested before they come. Uh, older people who uh, are still in the workforce, if they can't work from, they should work from home if possible. But if they can't, we should let them have a three to four month sabbatical during the height of the transmission, mm. uh, so that they are not exposed to working as a cab driver, as a janitor, in a in the food industry or whatever. Uh, and what's happened now actually is that we are protecting, and successfully so, the data shows that we are protecting. Uh, low-risk college students and low-risk uh, young professionals who can work from home, like lawyers or or uh, mm, uh, yeah. journalists or scientists, they don't need to protect it, but they are protected. We can afford and to lose a few old, of them as well. Yeah, they, are, they are so low risk, <laughs> and the, the higher-risk working class are out there. They're forced to work, mm, mm. so they're out there being exposed, and they are the one who's building up the herd immunity for the community, the community that eventually will protect all of us. So there's going to be another so we're virus. Putting the, we're, we're putting the burden on the working class and the older members of the working class. So in the United States, I think this uh, this uh, lockdowns is the worst assault on the working class since the segregation and the Vietnam War half, half a century ago. Because they also, the people who are against this say that those people are the most risk, at risk from the virus. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Well, we have to do proper job protecting them, and we're not doing that now. Mm. And that's very tragic. And that's what we're arguing for in the Great Barrington Declaration. And the longer the the longer the lockdowns are sort of postponing uh, the the pandemic, making it longer. And the longer we postpone the, the push it into the future, the more difficult it is to protect older people so and for them to protect themselves. So, did you? Did you ever ever advocate pro-infection to speed up the virus, to speed up the end of the no, virus? No, uh, that's stupid. People should not deliberately get infected. No. People should be able to live their normal lives, and, and some people uh, will be infected. That's inevitable. 
um, and it's done better if it's uh, younger, low-risk people who are infected than older, high-risk people. That's why we have to protect the older people. But nobody should be deliberately get infected. That's stupid. Everybody should do basic things like washing hands, mm. which is good anyhow. There's no harm in that. Mm. Uh, staying home when sick and so on. So things. Uh, so everybody should be do that because that also uh, uh, decreases the time of the, the pandemic. And that's something that we should continue for five, ten years for, for, for forever. Mm-hmm. Because those are just good things to do. Uh, people should also take care of themselves, general health. Uh, we know that uh, obesity and diabetes increases the risk of COVID-19. So people should also be encouraged to exercise more. And of course, to eat healthy and those kind of things. Mm. Uh, and uh, not just for, for COVID-19, but just in general. But so, for example, to closing... Uh, uh, basketball courts or gyms and so on uh, where people exercise that's very counterproductive mm. because there, it was like a society is like a tinderbox I mean I live in the south of Italy so it's quite a healthy comparatively healthy but there's still a, people are, you don't see very overweight you don't see anyone obese but still there's an epidemic of diabetes here everyone's on high pressure pills so and the, uh, you're in America so even there is is much worse no so sooner or later yeah. th- th- there was a lot of there's a lot of tinder this this a matchbox now sooner or- yeah and i think uh, uh, there was some study that says that if you have these comorbidities like obesity or diabetes then uh, that's sort of equivalent if you're like let's say 65 with this comorbidities then you're at the same risk as if you're in 70 without them so it sort of adds in terms of risk for COVID, it adds about five years to your life. Mm. So age is still by far the biggest uh, risk factor for for COVID nineteen, without any without any doubt and without any competition. But uh, uh, preventing people from living healthy lives by lockdowns is not a good idea. Mm. Yeah, I, I liked what I respect most respected in the Great Barrington Declaration is that you. You have to say you have to take the total cost of deaths, the total number affected by this number of people dying from poverty, the number of people who can't get access to normal health care. You have to look at the total number, just not the people dying from COVID. You can't focus on one illness. Correct. That's one of the basic principles of public health that was thrown out the window at the beginning of this year. You, you have to look at health as a whole. Um, you also have to look long term, not short term, and you have to look at the health of the whole, everybody in the population, including the working class and including children, and so on. Okay, because I, I'm trying to condense this into a song, so I think it's a good area to focus on is that the pandemic protocol that people have you have like you have said have thrown out the window. So, because there's other other viruses are going to come along, we're going to have other crises. We can't shut down every two or three years it won't it's not practical so yeah and of course with the next next pandemic maybe the countermeasures will be different because maybe it's not the the old who are at the high risk maybe it's some other group that's the high risk mm. and then we have to adapt the strategy to that um, so are there universal um, protocol measures that you would do for all types of viruses are you, is there a step-by-step 10-point plan or uh, no, the thing is to protect uh, those who happen to be at high risk for this particular virus. So if it's like AIDS, for example, you it's pretty easy. You target those people. You don't lock yeah, down. Exactly. You yeah. don't lock down everyone. Correct. Just... Yeah. Okay. So now if... AIDS is different because the transmissions, uh, the route of transmission is different from. Sure, for, it's an extreme uh, example. Yeah. yeah. But. Um, so what were the aspects again? But for example, so, if it's if it's a if it's a vector-borne disease, uh, then you have to look not only at the humans because maybe they're transmitted by a mosquito or some other animal. Mm. Then you have to sort of then the countermeasures has to be both in terms of protecting uh, people, but also dealing with the uh, reservoir uh, uh, among the animals, whether it's mosquitoes or whatever it is. And with global warming, we're all facing higher rates of these these mosquito-borne diseases the- yeah so changes in temperature can change the uh, can change the prevalence of uh, the habitat for the for the mosquitoes or 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 whatever the the, the vector the animal vector is hmm. and uh, that's something that has to be considered 
So with the protocol, you always look. So you look at the the length of time that the the measures will affect the people, um, and you look at the total number of of deaths or people at risk. Is that right? Yeah, you also have to look at if it spreads when people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, or whether it only spreads when people are very sick. Um, so, for example, the countermeasures for Ebola is different from COVID-19. Does COVID spread when it's asymptomatic? Uh, there's discussion of that, but it certainly spreads uh, for mildly symptomatic uh, uh, people. Okay, so that's another factor to look at because I need some lyrics here, so it's going to be... <laughs> so what other aspects of... When you, when you hear there's a new virus, what's the protocol? Uh, yeah, so it's very difficult to say because each virus is different. Okay. And so one has to, it has to be unique to each virus. So that's when, when the COVID came, it was very clear that there was an enormous age difference in mortality risk. And then we should use that. If you, if you have, then we have to use that uh, to combat this enemy. Uh, so the, if you look at it, just, we can say the weakness of COVID-19 is it that it's unable to kill uh, younger people. Mm -hmm. And then we have to use utilize that to beat back the, uh, the disease and therefore protect the older people uh, while letting the younger people live normal lives. If the risk profile was different so that the risk was equal in all ages, then we wouldn't do that tactic. We have to use some, some other tactics. So in a way, we are very lucky with COVID-19 that there is this very clear differential in risk between the old and the young. Uh, if we have a disease that primarily affects children, for example, mm -hmm. then yes, we should probably close the schools. Um, uh, so uh, uh, but for, a total, for, a to for a total lockdown, you'd have to, it'd have to be a very serious plague that really kills everyone. Yeah, I think uh, that's something that we haven't seen since the plague of the, in the 14th century, probably. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Because the cost... So hopefully, hopefully we'll never ever come to that. And that's also when the sanitary conditions were... Maybe in the third world you might have something like that, but even then you would never... The people would die from malnutrition before they would get be killed by the virus, no? Well, that's happening now in the developing world, Africa and Asia, that uh, uh, I read one study that said that about 10,000 children die from starvation uh, every month because of the lockdowns. So uh, this has, these lockdowns have affected uh, uh, Africa and Asia and, nor uh, and the poor population there severely and tragically. Because they're the not people, exporting uh, anymore. Well, they close the market and there are people who their their daily life is they sell some things in the market and they make yeah. a little bit of money every day and that little money that they make, they buy food for. So when there now is no market, they cannot make any money and they can't feed their children. Is that because they're copying the, the, the procedures that the Western countries are doing? They are following some of the scientific advice with advising lockdowns. And I think it's uh, very unfortunate that, I mean, I understand that politicians, they should think about their own uh, constituency and the areas, the country or region that they are responsible for. But as scientists, we have to take the international perspective and the Great Barrington Declaration is international. Uh, so we have to consider a developing world. And for scientists to say we should lock down without considering the absolutely horrendous negative consequences in Africa and Asia, is very nationalistic, very egoistic, very provincial, mm. uh, very shocking to see that uh, you have uh, scientists who can do that. I thought the the struggling was in the third world because of the they can't they're not they can't the exports the imports from the developed world are stopping. Um, that's probably part of it also, but that's not the whole thing. Oh, okay. uh, it's also that. Uh, uh, a small farmer who is growing onions and who takes them to the market to sell them and can no longer sell them uh, right. because the market is closed and therefore they can't feed their children. Mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, 
I mean, uh, some developing countries did not do lockdowns. Like I think the government of Malawi tried to do a lockdown and basically the population rose up and said no and prevented it, mm. oh, okay. uh, which was very good because uh, there are other places where there are such devastating effects. Mm. Well, I'm in the south of Italy and we're in, a, we're in a lockdown now. The schools are closed. We're not allowed outside our commune, our, lit, our parish area. So we're only allowed out for exercise. And the supermarkets are closed and, and a few shops are open, but there's no bars and cafes and, and the schools closed, as I said. So and the reason, you know, people are quite in favor of that. And they say the reason is that uh, the hospitals are overloaded and we, we don't want to overload the hospitals. Well, the hospitals were overloaded in the north of Italy um, back in uh, back in March, April. But if we do focus protection and protect the older, then the hospitals are not going to be overloaded because it's the older people that are not only at high risk of mortality, but they're also the high risk of uh, being hospitalized. Mm. Uh, children, very few children, like in Sweden, of those 1.8 million, there were zero deaths. There were a few hospitalizations, but very, very few. So children and young adults are not overburdening the hospitals. That's done by older people. Because they all so live in, put... they all live in multi generational homes here, though. So they do, they are mixing with the, the younger people. Yeah. So that's uh, that's actually the most difficult group to protect: older people in multi generational homes. And there was a study in Stockholm because it exists everywhere in the world, but to different degrees. But in Stockholm, that showed that uh, if you're over seventy and you live, uh, uh, if you're over seventy and you live with the working age adults that's under 65, versus if you look, live with uh, another older adult, uh, over 65, most of whom are retired, then you have, I think it was a 60% excess risk if you live with working age adults versus uh, another older adult. So there's certainly an uh, increased risk uh, for older people when they live in, the working, in, in a multi generation home. But what was also interesting is that if you, in addition to living with the working age adults, also live, had children in the household, that did not increase the risk any further. Mm. Uh, so it's not the children uh, that increases the risk, it's the working age adults. So uh, kids could still go to school, that's not a problem. But if you have a multi generation home, then uh, the working age adults should also, if possible, work from home. Mm -hmm. If that's not possible, then it would be wise for the older people to temporarily, during a few months, to live with uh, maybe an older a sibling or another mm. older friends who they can sort of uh, be protected with together. And if that's not possible, then I think uh, as a society, we should offer some of the empty hotel rooms that they can yeah. stay in for a short period of time. <laughs> we have plenty of hotel and, rooms. <laughs> yeah. And I think you have some of them nice by the ocean is in a very nice setting. Mm. So uh, so there are ways to protect older people in multi National Hope. You can't do it 100 percent. And of course, uh, you have to ask them what they want to do. Um, but uh, and of course, by dragging it out for, for over a year, uh, it makes it much more difficult for older people to protect themselves. But uh, Yeah, because longer is more at risk. Yeah, uh, but if we use focus protection strategy, uh, this will be over probably three, four months, at most six months. And it, will, it would have been over by now if we had done, used this from the beginning in March. Yeah, you must be pulling your hair out. I mean, because the, the governments are spending billions on uh, paying the salaries and like in England they pay the 80% of the salary um, and that money could have gone you could have built more hospitals to put you could have built enough hospitals to put everyone inside no yeah so uh, uh, I'm a public health scientist so I don't know the the economic side of things uh, but obviously there's a lot of economic damage and that money could have been used to to properly protect uh, older people and so what was the situation now in Sweden? Because this Sweden is really the, whenever anyone argues for or against, we all talk about Sweden. So I think the public health agency has done a good job. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an op-ed together with a colleague, an infectious disease uh, physician and epidemiologist named Rebecca Chandler, 
in the biggest Swedish daily newspaper arguing that Sweden needed to do a better job protecting the old. Uh, it messed up in Stockholm in the spring, but and it's not doing as bad as then, but still it's not doing a good enough job with the old. Instead, uh, what happened was that instead of the, it's, in the past it's always been the public health agency has been announced various measures, but uh, 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 a, a week or so ago, the prime minister actually stepped in and uh, announced measures for lockdown measures for the whole population. They didn't close the schools, but uh, uh, announced lockdown measures for, for everybody about gatherings. And I think that's very misguided. Mm. Uh, so instead of doing a better job protecting the elderly people, which should be done, uh, they are sort of trying to uh, copy the misguided and failed strategies of other countries in Europe. Well, and I don't, that, that's not public health. There's some political things going on that, but I don't understand the politics of these things, but there's something political there. Well, they must be under so much pressure from if everyone else is going left and you go right. Certainly there was a lot of pressure in the spring and they stood, they st and, uh, they stood against it and uh, went, yeah. So... Mm. But uh, schools are open and the people, uh, there are no, uh, the people in Sweden are not wearing masks. Uh, so uh, life is, I think, still more normal in Sweden compared to many other European countries. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I mean, when I was speaking to local people here, they all have this passionate reaction that, you know, the lockdown is in the interests of these vulnerable people because, okay, it's mostly the older dying, but the the people who have diabetes or severe cases of asthma or, or any number of autoimmune conditions, they are still at risk. And, you know, we put on a mask and we stay indoors. That's the least we can do to save to save lives. You know, it's, it's not our, it's everyone's, we shouldn't, it's a moral decision. You know, what do you, what do you think? So it's the opposite. Um, uh, it's actually, um, the lockdown strategy is killing people. Uh, both uh, in COVID-19 and uh, other other diseases. So it's a very misguided way of... Uh, but I mean, I understand that people think that way because that's what the media has been telling, mm -hmm. but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, young people, uh, young people, the best you can do to help others is actually to live a normal life. Wash your hands and those things, but uh, live a normal life, minimize... Uh, uh, the collateral damage and uh, and take care of each other instead of going in and isolating because the levels of child abuse are going through the roof and young people are feeling suicidal and having their it's all these yeah so with my older son who's 18 uh, i mean he the school closed for him in the spring and uh, then the summer i was pushing him out to go play basketball with his friends Mm. I'm not worried about the COVID. I'm worried if he, he uh, is sits at home isolated and don't hang out with anybody like uh, any of his friends. So I was, I've been always pushing, go mm. do your stuff, <laughs> go enjoy your, go enjoy your friends, go <laughs> play basketball, go uh, do all those things. I've got a note from my dad here. He's epidemiologist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's terrible. I mean, that's the hidden the hidden cost. You see, because the media they don't you don't care about the colon cancer deaths or the breast cancer deaths this time next year. Nobody will report that. But the COVID deaths is just what everyone sees. So yeah, and eventually we'll get the statistics for all these other deaths, and it will be uh, very clear of the enormous damage that this lockdown has caused. Uh, I think the responsibility falls uh, on uh, the politicians and the media who has not been willing to have an open scientific discourse about this thing. Mm. Well, I'm just, I'm so grateful to you for coming forward. Your conscience is clear. So um, is there anything you would do differently? Would you, if you, would you, in hindsight, would you, would you change anything? You mean me personally or in the strategy? Well, I guess in the strategy, you definitely change it, but more you personally. Is there anything you'd do in the, the declaration differently or would you have done it earlier? Or would you... um, when I, In March and April, when I uh, uh, failed to publish my thinking in the US media, I should have tried harder. 
uh, I had several rejections, but then at some point I said, well, this is not going to work. And instead I figured I'll focus on Sweden where I was able to publish things. But I should have tried harder in the US also. And is there anything you change about the declaration itself? Uh, no, so the declaration is only one page, so it sort of yeah. <coughs> covers the, the basics, but then we have a frequently asked questions where we go into much more details about okay. various things. But even then, uh, uh, there's not like a, the principle should be the same everywhere, but then the exact nature uh, would have to vary by country and time. So for example, how do you uh, make sure that older people in the 60s don't have to work as a cab driver or a or janitor, but to do a sabbatical. Well, in the US, I think one could use social security and let them use that for a few months. But in Italy, um, the systems are different. So I'm not sure exactly how to accomplish that in Italy, but I'm sure there's some way to do it through the pension system or the disability systems or, mm. or some other matter. Yeah, where there's a will, there's a way, no? Exactly. Mm. And it's much uh, less costly than these lockdowns. But do you think for the next virus they will learn? They will have will more money be invested in epidemiology and it's not so much I think that there's a need for more investments. I think it's more a need to have a more clear thinking. And I hope that uh, the thinking will be much more clear for the next pandemic. Mm-hmm. But who knows? I mean <laughs> it might be thirty years until we have the next pandemic and then uh, a lot of people have forgotten about 2020 maybe i always remember in japan there were these stones where the in on the land where how high the tsunami got and they say don't build your home below this but how there's many houses below that line and then these tsunamis come along yeah 30 years is a is a long time in anything so yeah Mm. exactly All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I'm sure you must be sick to the back teeth of talking to people about, you know, the pandemic. And but I, you know, you have thank you for the work you're doing, and uh, it is appreciated. Well, I'm sick of the pandemic, but I enjoy talking to people, and I really enjoy talking to you, Jack. So <laughs> thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to get to work on a song that uh, oh, okay incorporates a lot of what we talked about. Uh, looking forward to hear it as long as I don't have to sing it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Martin. Take care. Take care, B- Jack. Bye bye. What's pandemic protocol? Isolate the most vulnerable. What's pandemic protocol? The threat is small to protect them all. That's pandemic protocol, discoverable by the overall E-Man. How's the virus spread? Who's the most at risk? Take total demographics, and analyze this. Ensure protective measures, do more good than harm. Raise the pros and cons before you raise the law. What's pandemic protocol? Isolate the most vulnerable. What's pandemic protocol? The threat is small. Children. What's pandemic protocol? Isolate the most vulnerable. 
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review it on your podcast app. If you like the song, find it on all streaming services or at podsongs.com. Thanks to my musicians, Maurizio San Nicola and Massimino Vodza, and my researcher, Dori Verba. And to you, the listener, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>